Yeah, so when I started to work with Nick Donnelly on my thesis in Canterbury, we worked on perceptual grouping and since then I'm sort of interested in the topic and so today I thought I'll present some of my more recent work on this issue here. Uh, so I'm particularly interested how <coughs> perceptual grouping affects on the one hand attentional processing and on the other hand memory. And that's what this talk will be about. Um, in case you don't know, I thought to get started, maybe you should sort of experience what perceptual grouping actually does or what, what it helps you. Uh, to this end, I have this picture here, which is slightly more clear on this slide. Um, at first sight, I think you just see some gray, white, and black blobs. But the longer you watch it, uh, you might suddenly notice that there are some kind of there's a meaningful structure hidden in here. And so after a while, you might notice there's a cow in the picture, which is directly looking at you actually. And this is such a funny. I think once you've seen it, it's rather hard not to see it. No. Is there a lady here? One is cow. Perceptual organization structures your sensory input groups the individual elements such that you kind of form coherent objects. And as I said, that's sort of effortless. <coughs> you can do that in complex natural scenes without any limitations, it seems. Um, yeah. Here are some examples. Um, you didn't see the cow? No. Okay. <laughs> I can show you later. Okay. <laughs> uh, here are some examples of stimuli, how you could study perceptual grouping in a controlled laboratory environment. And one thing to notice here is maybe that uh, you just don't, it's not only grouping of fragments into an object, but you rather have something like a hierarchical structure very often in these stimuli that somehow emerges. So the uh, most well-known stimulus that has this hierarchical structure is the noun letter. We have local and global levels. So in my example, there would be local H's, and these H's form a global U. But you can also have other stimuli, such as the Kanitzer square, where you have semicircles, and if they, if they are arranged in a particular way, then you perceive a global square in the center of the figure. And you could have triangles made up of squares and so on. <coughs> and these, these are examples of such hierarchical structures. And so one effect that I'm quite interested in is global presidents. It has been known for a while, since the late 70s at least, uh, or even earlier, I guess. Uh, and so what is typically found in these objects is that the global level of representation is somehow prioritized. So uh, these global objects form some sort of salient regions, if you want, and these are attended with priority. Yeah. And in general, it's consistent with the notion that attention is sort of directed to integrated objects. And this is kind of the, I guess, one of the most well-known uh, papers on the global precedence effect by David Namon. Uh, he had a task with these Namon letters, and what you find uh, in the stimuli usually is that if you orient to the global level of representation, 
the reaction times are faster than if you were to the local level of representation. <coughs> and in addition also, that's a side effect, at least from what I'm telling you. Um, if you orient to the local level of representation, the interfering information at the global level can sort of have a negative effect, as you can see here. On the other hand, if you orient to the global level, the local layer will not interfere. So there's some sort of asymmetry here. And so this has led to the notion that it's like the forest is processed before the trees. And that's what the title of this paper actually is. Here's another example, uh, which I find a bit strange. So that's like what you do at the doctor, at least in Germany, so you have to detect differences. And then in my own thought that uh, he's still waiting for to be served. Oh, cool. no. <laughs> so the idea is that the more global objects are easier to spot. I'm not sure it's sort of confounded with the size in a way, but it's sort of, sort of an example of trying to pick out global presidents in real life, if you want. And yeah, I'm going to talk about this global presidents effect mainly today. I will present to you, at least that's the plan, uh, I want to present three lines of research. So three sets of experiments. Uh, first one is about Kanitz figures and the visual search paradigm and where I look at global and local differences with some Orion methodologies. And I'll present to you some results here. Um, then the next uh, set of experiments deals with Bomb figures, <laughs> and here I'm looking not only at attention but also at short term memory. And we're trying to sort of look at how uh, attention and memory are affected by these uh, hierarchical levels. Um, and then, in the third part of my talk, I will talk about long term statistical learning, if you want, uh, and I will deal with the so called contextual queuing paradigm. And uh, in this regard, I, I investigated how object grouping affects this long-term learning. So these are the three sets of findings I'm, I will address today. Okay, so first of all, with Kanitzer figures, um, you could think of them also in a hierarchical manner, as I already said. So you have a global and a local re level of representation in a way. So if you look at the square here, then you have semicircles, these are the local, representation and the square which emerges is the global representation just like in the novel method. Now if you rotate everything, such as in the example in C, uh, then the idea would be that now you have the same local arrangement of items in a way, but the global shape is missing. So the global representation of the object is lacking. At least it's not comparable. And um, in my version of the global presidents effect, uh, I used the visual search task where I played around with these stimuli. And um, we had two variants of essentially the same task. So we had either the uh, Kanitza square as the target and the kind of non squares, if you want, as the distractors. <laughs> and observers were simply asked to search for the square and say whether well, it's present or absent. Then we have basically the reverse condition where people search for the non square, which is like a symmetric arrangement of local items, uh, and the distractors were the global square configurations, uh, the Kanitza squares. And the question would be whether these two conditions differ. So, does search for a square differ from search for a non square? And, like, if you're interested in visual search, then uh, the you would notice that the feature contrasts between the two conditions are identical. So the difference between the target and the distractor in both cases is the same. Yeah, but you've got, you've got a single object onset there, and you've got six objects, uh, one, two, three, four, five, okay. six, seven objects onset. Global so. object onset. So we did this, Jeff okay. Cole and I did this. Oh, yeah, I think with, I the yeah, with, with uh, object onset. Captures attention. That's right, yeah, one shot change detection. Okay. And so, I mean, I guess I'm not disagreeing with you, but what I'm saying, you could characterize this as a six on seven object onset versus one object onset, right? And, and that object onset happens to be the target in that room, but not that one. Okay. 
Yeah, I think I, I think I read the paper, and in principle, it's it's, it's, it's consistent. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, agree. I mean, the, the difference I'm just spelling out is, is essentially due to the physical characteristics of the stimuli. Yeah. So there's no there are no six objects in the right or seven objects in the right display. And there's no no single object in the left display. All the difference is mainly due to perceptual grouping. That's I mean, you could argue that those. Um, I think I had such a comment. <laughs> distract. Okay. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't review it. <laughs> Nick, maybe. <laughs> the, um, but I mean, you could argue that there's a bit of perceptual grouping going on yeah. even in the distractors there, right? Yeah, um, I think with ours, we did them at random. Mm -hmm. I mean, I also tried other variants yeah. of this task, and if you start rotating the other objects around in a random fashion, then search gets really very, very inefficient. So, in fact, if you think about this, um, I think they call it line algebra. Yeah. Well, I'm not about it, other than that statement. These two patterns are equivalent, um, bar the fact that you have closure. That's mm -hmm. right, yeah. Item. yeah. So you really, your search is one closed item mm -hmm. against non closed items. Yeah. This is an over the rest of the And why is there equivalent? I mean, I think that's right, but the the only the only reason that I'm saying this is because this is a visual search experiment, and in that experiment that we published, we we showed that attentional capture was elicited by an object on set, even mm -hmm. though it was an illusory object on set, yeah. which actually involved the removal of a of, of physical stimulus mm -hmm. rather than the mm -hmm. presentation yeah. of a physical mm -hmm. stimulus, and that's in, in those terms, your experiment's just a little bit. You do, you know, you, I think you understand. That. I understand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, I guess you could also explain it like that in a way. So, it's, it's like an alternative explanation yeah, yeah, which yeah. leads to the same I think so, yeah. pattern. Yeah. Uh, so, here are the two displays, and uh, maybe from our discussion, we can guess the results. So, these are typical search functions. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. So, that's display size, so the number of objects presented. And we have two lines one for target absent and one for target present. You can see that the square configuration is searched for rather efficiently. So the slopes, which are shown here, are close to 10 milliseconds. And some time ago, you would have called this parallel search. So you're rather efficient, and you can detect that object independently of the number of items presented together with the target. In the right display, you can see that the lines go up, and there's a uh, slope increase, 21 and 70 milliseconds for present and absent displays. And this will be uh, a typical pattern for the serial search. So you sort of scan the display sequentially. So uh, then uh, how would you account for the difference in the intercept? The difference in the intercept? Yeah, this one is about um, at least 100 milliseconds slower. Um, yeah. Okay. Yes, I See that yeah, I mean, I think I, I didn't think too much about intercepts actually. Because <laughs> yeah. 100 milliseconds is a long time. Uh -huh. So there are also, I mean, like in visual search, you're always interested primarily, at least, in the slope of a, such a function, <coughs> yeah. uh, because that tells you something about search efficiency. I mean, about the intercept, I guess it's more difficult to say. Something, something about this, but obviously it requires more like basic integration time. That would be one of the thoughts I would have on this. But the main, the main idea here is that you have a difference. Is what class? Yeah, because the task is. So you, or is it blocked? Yeah, I think it was blocked. So a few years ago. <laughs> We have block trials because the task, the target is different. So you could also mix it, and maybe that works. Then also reduce the intercept. That's right. So Marcus, I think I lost track of the hypothesis you were testing by, mm -hmm. by looking at this effect in the context of the visual search task. Mm -hmm. So I understand what global precedence is. Okay. And I understand the explanation that Simon gave for why you might expect mm -hmm. this type of pattern. Okay. But I lost track of why you set out to do this experiment in the way that you did using a visual search task and contrasting these two conditions. Okay. 
So essentially, the idea is you have two conditions that are essentially identical with respect to the physical pattern, right. but observe uh, performance difference. Right. And so in one case, you observe efficient search for the global square. And so you could say that that global square is sort of your global representation that guides search. Yeah. And that's essentially global precedence compared to the same condition in a physical sense that uh, uh, gives you a rather inefficient search pattern. <coughs> so you're saying then that global precedence can be used in guiding search. Exactly. So, so my idea is like that these global global object configurations guide search. So you have something like salient regions that help you that are some sort of uh, guidance from where you would attend. And, uh, so in, the, in this case, you can do that efficiently, and in the other case, you can't. So, do you so I guess that's rather close to the idea. You have. salient signals that well, because are not then efficient in guiding search, or you can have the reverse side, so you have a, a coherent shape that helps you in selecting the target, or you have a shape which is more difficult to discern. Because in terms of local salience, mm -hmm. so on the right, so the, the, the top one definitely has a, a higher local salience, so if you if they use a guided search model, that will still predict that one is maybe uh, maybe it would capture attention. Mm -hmm. However, here you, you added another fact, you think because of this uh, maybe global precedence, mm -hmm. so that would override, or oh, that, that's more salient, which, do you see what I mean? I think the, the global precedence aspect is just a matter of explaining the stimulus. Yeah, yeah, I know, but, but I mean, if you put it into <coughs> the theoretical framework, for example, the guided search mm -hmm. model, if you, if you think, think in guided search, I'm not sure if that's at least. No, it's about, it can be anymore. I'm just thinking mm -hmm. why, if you think that one that one has so low priority, uh, mm -hmm. even though if you think about say local say uh, think about salience per se, because one two three four five six seven, there are seven are actually identical to each other. So that one's different from seven mm -hmm. of them. But it so if you simply think about salience, that one should have higher salience value. But uh, obviously it's not because it's not producing. Yeah, so I think my idea is like that in the left case, there's like a, a global shape that emerges and that can be used efficiently to guide search. In the other case, there's no such thing as a global shape. There's a local configuration, so in a way, you have to look for four local spots in a way that are arranged in a particular way. So yeah, that will make the difference. Yeah. yeah? Okay, so I'm just saying that here we have something like a global local search asymmetry, which speaks for this idea that <coughs> something like global precedence in guiding attention. We have then done uh, the same also using EG. Um, the task was essentially the same. Uh, so we had this place like this. The only difference was that now we had a fixed display size and we only had two objects one on the left and one on the right. And in half of the trials, people were to search for the square <coughs> target, and in the other half, they were to search for the non-square target among always the 
to distract us. And you can see here the behavioral data, basically they replicate our previous findings, so we get the benefits in reaction times for global relative to local targets, and we also get a difference in the error rates. <coughs> and then we looked also at the EEG and we derived the ERP components and um, we found several differences and the most pronounced was uh, in the N2PC <coughs> which is a lateralized component so it's obtained by subtracting ipsilateral from contralateral electrodes and uh, this then tells you where attention is located in space and this component is shown here, that's the N2PC and what you can see is that there is a, a rather large latency difference between global search and local search. So if you search for the global target, then this NTPC peaks about 80 milliseconds earlier than if you search for the local configuration. What is the local configuration? That's this target here. I'm just calling this a local target because there's no global target. <coughs> so if you search for this among this, you're kind of later yeah, into so PC. It's I mean, what is a global this, search? This is local search and this is global search. Because I'm just saying one is the global target because you have a, a global Kanitsa square as the target and in the other case you have a, a local configuration only as the target. It's rotated Pac-Man uh, and that's why I call local search. Yeah? Mm. And so this is like a marker of attention essentially uh, and it tells you in a way that the allocation of attention occurs later uh, on the target if you um, search for this kind of configuration where you don't have a global object so that's a local search condition and you're more efficient to search for the global object on the so other So it's hand. a long scene that wrote the trials which is like distracted. Yeah, there, there are target absent trials too. Okay, so, <coughs> so, so uh, the display so data are uh, taken just from those files. So for the N2PC, you, you look at where the target is and you subtract okay. so contralateral so from ipsilateral. So those data are taken from the same yeah. physical trials, it's just the instructions. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. That's right. <coughs> so there were also target absent trials, but there you can't look at the N2PC because it don't have a so what is that delay in the, uh, the, the lag in the red relative to the blue of the lag? Well, the idea would be that the N2PC is like a marker of selective attention and so it sort of tells you when the tension moves left or right and uh, so if you have that delay it simply tells you that the processes that guide attention take longer and therefore your shift of attention comes later. To put it bluntly, Shree, that's your intercept. Right? Um, that's that 100 millisecond. You could argue that that's a, okay. a reflection of that 100 millisecond. Yeah, I would think that. Usually, I think usually you would think, think that the, the latency of the N2PC is sort of associated with search efficiency. So the, the data. Yeah, the intercept. The intercept? No, it's not. It's about 100. Okay, um, <laughs> so the third experiment was then essentially the same thing more or less, but now uh, we try to do it uh, with patients. And so we had some patients which suffer from uh, visual extinction, so that's basically, if you want, a mild form of neglect, maybe spatial neglect. So they have some sort of failure to identify stimuli at the contralesional site if they are presented together with a second stimulus. So here are some examples. Um, if you present an object on the right, they would have no problem in identifying that object. <coughs> if you present a target object on the left, they would be able to identify it. But if you present two objects, they would usually only report the right-sided object and so extinguish the left-sided object. And this patient group 
it has been sort of well, it has been shown that they basically or usually don't have major problems with the perceptual processing, but rather what they show is uh, an impairment of selective attention. And therefore, there are some sort of group of subjects that one could use very well to test pre-attentive processing, if you want. So, where you could look at what type of information is available if attention is not functioning. Can you just be clear about what you mean by pre-attentive processing? You mean parafocal <coughs> processing prior to direct fixation? I mean, the objects were presented in the center. So, uh, so essentially it's the idea what, what information is available before attention is so, the object is that, is that, in the center, are you talking about when you actually do the next experiment? Um, because here they're not presented in the center, are they yeah. presented on the right? No, I mean, yeah, well, uh, that's just an example, yeah, but I mean, of course they were not right in the center, but they were like within the phobia, so like, okay. I think five degrees in the center of the phobia. And the experiment we conducted, and I should also <coughs> guide you maybe to a second paper which did something very similar, but uh, yeah, our paper probably extended their results a bit. Um, so here's the paradigm. So we present these patients with some sort of black dots at the center of the screen. And then after a while, for a short period, uh, we cut out some segments. Uh, and these segments can be cut out either on the left side of the display, on the right side of the display, on both sides, or not at all. <coughs> so here you see examples of these different stimulus categories. And then the patients have to simply say where the cutout was present. So it was left, right, or among. And there were, well, what I'm reporting here now, two conditions. One was the ungroup condition, and the other was the Kanitza square condition. So here you should see that we have a Kanitza square, which connects <coughs> the two <coughs> lateral portions of the object. So you have a coherent object extending across the hemifield. And here, you don't have the same thing going on. So you don't have any grouping connection, if you want, extending to the left side of the visual field. <coughs> the question would now be, do these conditions differ? So here's again the illustration of how grouping might have an impact on one or the other configuration. So what was your prediction? How do you have that? Well, well, I would say that if, well usually what you would observe is that if you present a, a stimulus with targets on the left and on the right, then uh, these patients would only report the right-sided objects. They would say right here. But if there's a grouping and they have access to this grouping information, then they should be able to do the task correctly. <coughs> so the Kanitza configuration should be better than that one. But the task is to say which side has cut mm -hmm. circles. Yeah. And your prediction is so that performance will be If you have cut circles on both sides, they would extinguish the left circles and just report the cutout segments on the right. That would be the sort of idea. But if they sort of can group the information, then maybe and if this grouping is there before attention comes in, then they should be able to do the task and they should be able to report both sides. You can see the data. I mean, that's what happens. <laughs> so, we are particularly interested in comparing left detections for stimuli where there's just a unilateral left cutout segment, so where there's just something cut out on the left side, compared to the bilateral display where you should have extinction. And you can see, as predicted, uh, observers were able to detect the left sided cutout segments. <coughs> If they were unilaterally presented, so both types of configurations were in the range of 60 to 70 percent correct detections. There was no difference between the two. Now if you look at the bilateral displays, then you can see that there is extinction going on. So 
performance drops from like 60 to 20 percent if you have these ungrouped displays. But if you have grouping information available, then people are able to extract all sides of the display and they can sort of report the uh, full configuration. <coughs> so they have access to the grouped complete object representation even though attention is sort of deficient if you want. Yeah. So and this would then speak for the pre-attentive coding of global integrated objects in a way. Are they aware of it? Because uh, of the problems? Well, with neglect, you can sometimes have that they don't see it, but then if you ask them to make an educated guess whether or not something is there that is slightly above chance I'm levels. Sure they're aware of it. I think they're not really aware of it. We never, you never checked. They didn't really look at that system. I mean, so, I mean, essentially they sit with you in the cabin and they tell you what their response is to yeah, make yeah. sure they don't have So it's a verbal report then? The they have a verbal report. That they're not aware of it. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> I mean, we don't really register if they say, mm, maybe there was something. So I mean, we just have four key presses yeah, responding yeah. to the. Yeah. Okay. So that was the first part of my talk. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like I'll probably not make it. <laughs> no one ever does. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so I'll show you some examples of global presidents and their effects on attention. So, global presidents is the idea that the global level of representation is processed with priority. And I've shown you some results which sort of support this idea. <coughs> with the use of so-called Kandinsky figures. I've shown you some results which suggest that global search is more efficient than local search. So that would be the target representation that I'm addressing here. Uh, and these differences that we observe are also reflected in an ERP component, namely in the N2PC. And in particular, we observe a rather large difference in latency here. Uh, and then the third line of Experiment or the third experiment <laughs> showed uh, with these neglect patients or if you want extinction patients that global object information is really available at three attentive stages of processing. Okay, and now I don't know, I could either just carry on. <laughs> okay, so the second set of findings now is not purely based on looking at attentional influences, but also at memory. That's the idea, short-term memory. And, uh, well, usually these Navon task type of configurations, you only have a single display presented in, in a screen. Um, for example, in the original Navon study. Um, however, there has also been one single study by Deco and Heinke, uh, which used a variant uh, some kind of a visual search task with normal letters as targets and non-targets. Here is an example of such a display. Mm, so in that task, you search for the H, global local H, so that would be this one. And uh, then you have distractors and they can either have an H at the global level or an H at the local level <coughs> or no H at all. So they sort of manipulate the, the similarity to the target. And they find that well, global similarity is primarily impairing search performance. So if you have a global age, they have slopes of 26 and 70 milliseconds. If you have a local age, like here, you have 16 and 27 milliseconds. So that's, that example here would be the local age condition. So they sort of showed something like a global precedence effect with these types of stimuli. And we then thought, well, we could also devise such a task. Um, and our task was a bit different than that one. Um, and it's shown here. But nevertheless, it had a long letters stimuli. So essentially, we had a T amongst L search task, which is quite frequently used uh, in the visual search community. <laughs> and 
the major difference was whether the target was defined at the global level or at the local level. And here you can see the target is defined at the global level of representation and it points to the left, so people would press the left button. Here you can see a local target on the top right uh, pointing to the right, and in this case, subject would press the right button. And so we were simply interested to see uh, whether this global and local target <coughs> configurations would show any difference. So that was one factor, and then we have the second factor that displays us again to look at search efficiency. And now I'm showing you the results. So, first on the left side, you can see the typical search functions. And first of all, what you can observe is that the task is fairly hard overall. So, uh, we have response times between one second and two seconds around. And the slopes were 80, 90, 100 milliseconds. So that's one thing to observe, the task is rather hard. Um, you can also see that there was a massive difference between the global target configuration and the local target configuration. So if you have a local target, you are 640 milliseconds faster than if you have a local target. And that's the second thing to note. The third thing is then that uh, there was a change in search efficiency as indexed by the slopes of the search function. So in one case, you had serial search, but nevertheless, the slope was flatter than in the other case, so 80 versus 133 milliseconds. So in a way, again, this sort of shows, as in the previous paper by Deco and Heinke, that there is a global precedence effect observable in visual search. We then were also interested to look at memory and we did that in the context of this task by looking at uh, inter-trial effects. So the, the idea is that if you look at performance in one trial relative to what has been there before, then this is some sort of short-term memory effect or if you want some priming effect that occurs. And in my lab in Munich, people do that quite a lot, and so I thought it's time to start with that as well. Um, yeah, you can see that there were some systematic effects. So we looked at whether a given target repeats across two trials versus whether a given target switches. And you can see uh, that the global target level <coughs> reveals the difference between repetitions and switching. In other words, we have a priming effect of 150 milliseconds here. If you look at the local target configuration, you can see that the repetitions don't matter really. So you don't get a comparable priming effect here. And this would then sort of suggest that you can maybe see global precedence, not <coughs> only in functions related primarily to attention, but also in functions which sort of tap into short-term memory processes. It's like an attention of set almost, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, well, it's, it's closely related to attention, I would yeah. agree, but... That's quite interesting. But you have this asymmetry. Um, this was the first experiment, and... So I'm just, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. It might be the review. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> it's still in preparation, no. so we haven't suggested someone yet. Okay. <laughs> So, so where is the global presence? Because I mean, it's obviously I can see, mm -hmm. but but if you if the precedence is in your priming, mm -hmm. you're aggregating over all of that. You know, yeah, that's fine. Right. Yeah. So the precedence isn't in the fact that you intuitively adopt a global set prior to the beginning of the trial. <coughs> The advantage is in the fact that if you get a global target in trial one, the faster respond to the global target in trial two, whereas you don't get the equivalent at the local targets. If you go back to you know, trial zero and ask the question, what's the mindset of the subject of the experiment? It's not that there's the global present isn't in the fact that they automatically switch at that project level, because in fact they haven't done it. 
I think Nick's right. I think that's a really good point. So it, it's as though you can't, because you can't accumulate, accumulate the primary effect for the local, you don't see the big difference that you see there. But because you can for the global, you do. And having done it, that changes everything. Yes. Back yes. to that point. Yeah, you, you, you either go back, you're never back in that starting state. Yeah. yeah. Do you think once you search for a global target, you will never? Probably never. <laughs> 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 I'm just observing. You actually could do the same analysis across all these, all these. I should look at the first trial only. Yeah. Well, you have a hell of a lot of experiments. Mm -hmm. yeah, because, because you actually at a different scale. Yeah. You use the yeah. different spatial frequency. Yeah. Because at the uh, global level, you are at the uh, lower spatial frequency. So you are looking. So you are looking at. Well, I think that's exactly next point. So that if you see, if you are at global level, you don't need to see the the fine details in the local level. So I I I just need just to pour the filter now. So so it's F. Now, but if I have to see that in the in the local level, I do need to zoom in. So I have to. Uh, <coughs> to just see the local level, so I, I will not see if this local level F, I will see the local level, say, H. And that, and that is why you get this asymmetry in So, because you have this additional zooming in process, essentially. Yeah, because, mm -hmm. because, you, because you have to look at the, the mini one. Mm -hmm. But if you're starting from a, local, from mm -hmm. a, uh, from a global level, you mm -hmm. got so you only need to look at the local level, uh, the, the global level. You don't need to zoom in. You don't need mm -hmm. to look at the uh, local one. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the the, the paper by Deco and Heinke goes a bit in this direction also. Yeah, so if you know these names, then you know they do lots of computational modeling. They also have a model to explain the. Well, data. I think that dates back like in that. The in the, in the, in the early part, like in 1978, Schumann, they also mm -hmm. did a lot. Yeah. I think that um, like Schumann, mm -hmm. they probably started with this sort of thing. Schumann, that's a Schumann. It's a bit like. I think what Chewie said, it's a bit like the visual process things from, mm -hmm. you know, fine to call to special things, yeah. or call to fine to special things, it feels mm -hmm. like what was that what you were saying? Was it different? Yeah, yeah. 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 <coughs> just possibly isn't what you think is interesting but they're very interesting <laughs> What's, what I think might be interesting that's good then <laughs> what I think might be interesting is that it seems to reveal the possibility that all global precedence effects are essentially an expanding the repetition of global on global triangles which isn't present on local on local triangles that's a different kind of global presence to the explanation that we automatically process things at a global level. Mm -hmm. Because you've actually, the other way of putting it is you've got a cost. If, if you've never seen a global target on a previous trial, there's a cost. Right? So it's not that global processing. So, so, so the, the, the cost main will be the switch. The main yeah. factor, the difference between the global and the local is what she does, is what she is yeah. explaining and mm -hmm. great special. But within that, there's another effect, which is that my global presence so accumulates is only as strong as it might be if on the trial previously I saw a similar thing. In other words, a different mechanism. Now, the interesting question would be if you could go back over all, of all studies of this and reanalyze the data mm -hmm. by so and trials to repeat, would they show the same? Mm -hmm. Could you look at the slopes for repetition versus switch? So global yeah. repetition. Well, versus I mean, you have the switch. problem that sort of mm -hmm. if you if you then look at if you look at slopes, then probably you should have longer experiments to get more robust data. data. So that's why we combined the uh, analysis of intertrial effects.
across all these play sizes because you end up with sort of wiki patterns. Can you say that? You can say it. I don't know what it means. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure if it was correct in English. But you can think of the meaning. But maybe the next experiment <laughs> helps us a bit. Uh, yeah. So we found this massive effect here, and I just continue now with the way how I would interpret <laughs> And we thought, well, this is a really big effect, and we have this memory effect, uh, this priming effect. Uh, so the question would be, can we somehow push the system to go for the local detail? So can we create a condition where the observers would simply look for local representations? Uh, and we did that by changing target prevalence, so that the number of times a given target appears. And what happened now in experiment two was that we had only rare global targets on 25% of our trials, and we had a local target on three quarters of our trials. And so the idea was that this should then sort of manipulate the global precedence effect. All else was the same, essentially. Um, here you can see the results. Um, well, first of all, the search pattern. You can see uh, the slopes are still kind of steep. Uh, now we don't have a significant difference anymore between the slopes, so the search efficiency, if you define that by slopes, would be comparable. We still have an intercept effect uh, of 230 milliseconds, which is still quite big, but compared to the 600 before, it's much smaller. Um, that's the first thing to observe, so we have global precedence, but it's massively reduced. But what is the incentive for, uh, to follow the instruction? Okay, we didn't, I mean, we, I think we didn't really control for that. We just presented subjects with a given statistical distribution. Yes. So you can see that they followed it from the change in pattern, maybe. <laughs> but uh, we didn't explicitly say try to get the local configuration. Yeah, yeah just say something. Mm -hmm. Often you tell them to do something, but if, if some tendency is so strong, they wouldn't do it. So if you don't have real incentives, mm -hmm. or do you think we should give them like... Uh, well, sometimes yeah, if, you sure really, if you really do those expectations, mm -hmm. uh, if you really want to manipulate, you need to have some incentives or penalties mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. to really coerce them to adopt certain strategy. Mm -hmm. Because here you want them to adopt the strategies to mm -hmm. you know, pay attention to at the local level. But uh, if, they, if they just used to it, just yeah. to look at it, if that's what I normally so do. Yeah, so I mean, maybe if I say, well, you, I'll take you 10 cent off your final well, I don't know. from it's the subject. <coughs> or sometimes you just need to have really uh, very motivated uh, participants yeah. like yourself. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think I'm quite bad in these tasks. But, you know, but <laughs> I didn't do that, but nevertheless, I think there's a change in the pattern a little bit. And you also get a change in the priming pattern because. Now what you observe is essentially priming occurring at both levels. So you have a benefit when the global target repeats, and you have a benefit when the local target repeats. So it seems like you can maybe uh, push the system a bit into the kind of local direction if you want, but you cannot abolish this global precedence completely. At least not, at least not for this type of task. What was the value before? I think so, yeah. So what all you're doing is you're inducing it in local, but you're not modulating yet. So there's no cost on global, but there's a benefit on, on local, local, right? Okay, that's interesting, yeah. Yeah. So you, you can't do anything about the global, yeah. but you, you're only yeah. kind of... But you can bring it in on the local. Yeah. But the... Um, you try hard. Yeah. So the... What I'm struggling a little bit, maybe this is Shui's question, what I'm struggling a little bit to understand is, you know, you've got these effects that represent repetition and we'll call them primary effects, right? And so I'm always, I mean, you know, I kind of thought I had a good idea of what priming is all about, and perhaps I'm wrong. But, you know, I always thought that the, basically the relationship between the prime and the target, if you showed some benefit or cost to, to 
for that, then it's generally an indication that that shared character characteristic is represented in the system that's processing it. Mm -hmm. Now, if that's the case, I think that's I think that's not probably too far off being correct. Actually, mm -hmm. but if that's true, then I wonder what it is here. I mean, what is it? That's, be, that's, that's represented in the system. Do you see what I mean? Is it about the core spatial frequencies, or is it that you're tuning the processor to operate at a particular level? You know, I would say the latter, or maybe a bit of both, because of course spatial frequencies play a role here. So so the neck, but so hey, really it's about like where you sort of, at which yeah. level you. Just away and hang up for So the global pressing system is not affected by the preference of the target, even when the search for the global target is. Yeah? So the slopes are okay. steeper. Okay. But the so priming effect remains constant. Okay. Uh, the same isn't true for local mm -hmm. condition. Now, so to go back to my previous what that's sort of indicating is that the global pressing effect is driven by whatever it is that drives the prevalence effect by default. In other words, you assume the global pressing is the target will be at the global level. It's, an, mm -hmm. it's like a, it's an assumption. And you can change that in the local condition because that's not the truth. Well, yeah, because you can you okay. can see the global one anyway. For example, maybe Take off your glasses. You can see that you can see the, the the global shape, right? But you won't be able to see the see the local one. In other words, the local one you need to make an effort. So the global one is just there. So you don't need to make much effort. Was a little bit effort, but does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But you don't need your glasses. I think I like so. So the idea is like. Like the, the global so representation is like a static search. It's driving. Mm -hmm. So that's like a static the thing that is there. The global the preference is the same. It's driving. The global preference is the same. It's driving. The global preference is the same. It's driving. The global preference is the same. There's a working assumption that we're operating yeah. the global preference. Because, because it is uh, the global preference. But you can turn that off so and make it work for a long time. So push, so push if you can, keep pushing on the other way. Mm -hmm. So the, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, in the other way, so you mean more. So you have 95% local and 5% local. Okay, so it's really extreme. Yeah. Okay. So I wonder if you could, I, I think in principle, whether I suspect it might be the case that you could never get more than 160 millisecond effect for the locals. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. So if the. Max, you know, the default is that's that's as far as you can go in your globals, you know, that's mm -hmm. it. And then you can just nudge this one, you can bang away at it, and when you've got everything ramped up, you get to what is the global. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And I think that that's oh, what that's trees. That's a, trees. I mean, I think I, I think, I think that's I what I'm saying. That perspective was... It's not completely different from what I would think about. So, I still have a third experiment <laughs> in this series of experiments. Mm. Uh, and there we try to see whether this global precedence effect can be sort of biased more or less dynamically throughout the experiment. So, uh, this time we only had one display size, 12 only. Uh, everything else was basically as an experiment one. And what was different now was that we manipulated prevalence across the experiment. So we started out in phase one of the experiment with a balanced global local ratio. So there were 50% <coughs> of targets in the first part of the experiment as an experiment one. Then we switched to the local prevalent version of it, where we had mostly local targets as an experiment two. And then finally in the, in the phase three, we had the global prevalent phase where we had mostly global targets. And so the question will be whether you can sort of adjust the president's effect by manipulating the 
frequency of presentation. And here are the results right away. Um, again, here you see the search reaction times. You can see we have massive effects now uh, of 800 milliseconds initially in the balanced version. And then this drops to at least half of it, to 400 milliseconds in the local prevalence uh, part of the experiment, so that would be phase two. And then once we have again more global targets, the precedence effect recovers and we now have not 800 but at least 600 milliseconds different. So here we <coughs> this looks like learning to me, right? As in our IED mm. learning stuff. Or even as in our uh, the studies that we've got Scoot going on the, on the configurations and the, yeah. uh, the distortion, distortion configurations. That's very interesting, actually. How many trials in each phase? So oh, uh, actually, well, we made the experiments yeah. that, uh, such that they lasted like 15 minutes or so. Because so. normally prevalence takes about 40 to 50 trials to kick in properly. Okay, so, so I mean, there were, overall, there might have been like. 700 trials. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we try to get robust measures in this no, space. Exactly, so, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So essentially, <laughs> what I would say here is that you get a modulation of the precedence. See, if you look at the search reaction times, and now we also, of course, look at the priming effects, so the inter-trial effects. And here I'm plotting the difference between switch and repetition, so that's like the net priming effect, essentially. And what you see is that there's more priming in phase one for global targets <coughs> as compared to the local targets. So there's this asymmetry again that we observed in experiment one. But the important thing to observe is that the relative difference in priming across all three phases stays more or less the same. So we always have the same kind of <coughs> ratio. So on average, 200 milliseconds prime for the global targets this time, and 80 milliseconds for the local target. I don't understand. You say prime, but there it says switch cost. Yeah. Okay. Switch benefit would maybe be better. So I mean, if you have a switch, it's a cost. If you repeat, it's repetition benefit might be better. But what is it? What? Why are you counting that? Is that cost or? I, I just plot the difference between repetition and switch trials. Is it the same scale as the 160 value that you showed before? Yeah. And the negative 3? Yeah. yeah. Okay, it's the same scale. Yeah. So it's increased to 2 Yeah, so in a way, the, the, the pattern doesn't change if you look at priming effect. So it seems that like this is fixed initially, but then it doesn't, it isn't modulated by the, the occurrence of targets anymore. So it seems like attention and memory both show this global precedence effect, but only kind of attention is modulable, it's kind of dynamically adjustable, but the memory aspect of it is sort of set initially but then stays. So there's been an asymmetry in repetition trials in the sense that when a global configuration is repeated, uh, the global aspects of that configuration are the same, but the local features can change. Whereas with the repetition of the of local trials, you have repetition of the local features but as well as the local features. Um, Does that make sense? Do you have examples where you actually can show? No, but we actually we looked at whether it matters that the so so that the effects stay essentially mm -hmm. the same. If you look also at cases where the global rep the global target repeats, but uh -huh. the configuration changes. Okay. So if it points to the right in one trial and to the left in the next trial, you have examples you can show. Uh, I only have the displays that I showed. Uh, it's okay. I'll talk about there. So essentially, it's not dependent on the exact configuration of the targets that you okay. process, but rather on the level. Okay. So if you switch the orientation of the target, that doesn't matter. So that's that's included here and. You take, if you look at them separately, you would get the same patterns. Okay. Uh, just one point of clarification. So, 
in these in the phases when they move from one phase to another, they don't know anything about this the subjects, do they? They just want to do it. They just doing the experiment, that right? Yeah. Some, so something seems to be there more frequent now. Almost li implicitly learning to yeah. process stimuli preferentially one way rather than another based on essentially repeated trials. So they're extracting systematically from their visual environment, right? Mm -hmm. But it could yeah. be explicit. You have no way of knowing. I, mean, Maybe didn't yeah. I don't really care about the explicit implicit thing. The point is that, you know, I mean, yeah, the yeah, first yeah, yeah, they're, yeah. they're learning something, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, they're, and, they're, and, they're, and they're not telling them you're going to learn something different in this phase compared with this phase. <coughs> compared with this phase. So, when Mark arrived, he said to me, I've got a thought for five minutes more. I'm looking at that time. Yeah, so I'll tell you what, really, five minutes just to wrap through the last bit. And then we'll have a chat. 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 Okay, so you still want to see the yeah, next video? Just run through it. And then we'll, uh, okay, five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Five minutes. Okay. Five minutes. Okay. We don't expect it. So, <laughs> Well, this was the second part, <laughs> uh, and so I've shown you this, if you want, global precedence effect in attention and short-term memory. And from my point of view, at least from our point of view so far, I mean, we can discuss this later, uh, we can sort of disambiguate the two, or disentangle the two, and show that attention is sort of rather dynamic in adjusting, but memory is not. So we have <coughs> the same type of process going on, but with other, in a different underlying dynamic. So now I would like to come to long-term learning and grouping, as I said initially. And here I use the contextual queuing paradigm. That's about, essentially, if you want, uh, scene learning in natural scenes. Uh, so essentially the idea would be that if you live in that room and you search for an object, you know where all the objects are and sort of the relative location of all objects will tell you uh, something about whether your target will be. So for instance, if you search for your hat, as shown here, the context of items surrounding the hat will maybe guide your attention to the target. And I'm interested in that sort of effect. Uh, and uh, in the last part of the, my talk, I wanted to tell you something about that. First of all, I would have to say something about the contextual queuing effect uh, because that's the basic paradigm that we use here. So if you don't know it, I guess I have to explain it. Um, so it has been known for a while that invariant scene information can facilitate object selection. For example, Palmer in the 70s. Uh, and in the 90s then, Chan and Chiang have shown that the spatial layout of a scene, or if you want a search display, can facilitate detection of a target. And they suggest that this is an implicit mechanism, by the way. So the task is essentially the same as before. So uh, you search for the T and say whether it points to the left or right, and you have L distractors. What the subjects don't know is that <coughs> some, on some trials, you present a set of displays uh, that are repeated over the course of the experiment. So across 30 blocks maybe, you present the target within an invariant configuration of non-targets, such as shown in the top row, and you compare that to the new condition, where you have an, a set of displays with invariant target locations, but random organizations of the context, the destructor items. And that's the main effect that Chan and Chiang observed. Uh, so first of all, this is epoch, the duration of the experiment. And as the duration continues, you get quicker. That's the first thing to notice. The important thing is that there's a difference between old and new displays. So as you are presented with these repeated displays, so the old condition, you're progressively faster to respond <coughs> to the new displays. And this is the contextual queuing effect. So it's a difference between red and blue. And the idea is that this is due to learning. So um, as you're presented with this display, you generate maybe some sort of associations. And these help you to retrieve the target location more efficiently. So that was a quick introduction to contextual queuing. Uh, now I was 
kind of interesting to see how that relates to perceptual grouping once again. Uh, in a way, learning of associations is a way of providing structure to the environment, to the environment by means of memory mechanisms, if you want. On the other hand, perceptual grouping also provides structure by means of bottom-up perceptual processing. And so the question would be whether both processes sort of interact in establishing structure. That's the idea. And we started out with that kind of display, so we had a square grouping in these displays, and we thought, well, the square grouping should sort of provide some sort of an angle and <coughs> should therefore lead to improved learning, so improved contextual cue. That was the idea initially. So here is the experiment we did. So we had a baseline condition without grouping and a square condition with square grouping. And so we thought, well, the cubing effect should be larger here. <coughs> the effect were actually quite opposite. So we got a big contextual cubing effect in the baseline condition. So we get a big difference between old and new across the experiment. If you look at the square condition, there was no effect whatsoever. So you basically had no benefit in searching for the target. So how, how many repeated this How many trials per hour? Mm -hmm. How many trials per hour? Uh, so overall, I think 700 trials in the experiment, and so okay. each block has usually 24 displays, 12 old, 12 new, and then six standards, uh, six baseline, and six square. And so if you average that across 30, uh, 30 blocks, or if you want six epochs, then you get 30 times 24. Something. So the effects emerge very, very early on. Yeah, it's I mean, it looks like it's well. immediately there, but actually, if you look, if you break down the <coughs> and look at it on a block by block basis, then you see that it's there from block three onwards. Okay. So, like here in the middle, it's there. So it suddenly comes and then it's there forever. <coughs> so, we thought then, well, maybe an explanation would be that. Grouping reduces the amount of predictable cues, and therefore contextual cueing is weaker. And we found effects that would suggest that type of thing, on one hand with these square groupings, but also with similarity-based <coughs> grouping displays, so we have color similarity and things like that. But we then also thought the absence of contextual learning could also be because the grouped square is so, in a way, a region where the target will not appear. So what would happen if the target is within the boundaries of the square? And that's what we tried in these experiments I'm showing you now, and I'm trying to be quick. So we had this place like this, big squares this time. You might see it, I'm not scared. So here's a hint, a help line. Uh, and the target could be inside or outside. And we just compared inside versus outside the square. So that would be target on and target off this place. Here's once again the red line for your help. Let me try to control for eccentricity and the amount of possible locations and so on, more or less. Um, yeah. I'll skip that and go to the results immediately. You can see that target off square positions, so where the target is outside the square, don't show contextual queuing as before, so that basically replicates our previous findings. But when the target is located within the boundaries of the square, you get reliable learning effects. So you get this contextual queuing effect. Um, so there's a difference between within and outside of the grouping. So that's essentially the effect when taking the net difference, so new minus old, for on target, off target. We then continued to conduct two more experiments where we tried to sort of reduce the, if you want, salience or the goodness of the grouping. And um, <coughs> in the second experiment, we then presented a non square. So now the L's that make up, make up the square were rotated outwards such that there's no closure and collinearity anymore. Everything else was the same. 
the idea was that now the grouping should be weaker, and maybe then this modulation is gone. But essentially the pattern was very similar, it got the same effect. So we've got Q in here and no Q in for the type of condition. So we thought, well, it still doesn't work. Um, so then we tried a third variant where we tried to even provide a less effective grouping. And that was what we call a random square. So we had essentially an arrangement of four items in the square, but each L was rotated randomly in one of four directions. So there was no symmetry, no collinearity, just the spatial coherence of the four positions. But to our surprise, this still modulated the effect. So we got contextual cubing here, but not if the target was off the square. Um, yeah. So now if you summarize these patterns across the experiments, you can see that we always get target on, uh, target on learning and target off. There's no such learning. So there could be a confound now because the square on average is going to have to be closer to the center of the display, right? So by definition, you kind of have a target on the square. It'll be close mm -hmm. to the center of the display, whereas a target so out of the square is going to be more the periphery. Yeah, I mean, we tried to, to uh, control for these differences and we didn't allow the central positions to be, you know, that the square would be at the central positions and we also didn't allow the peripheral positions. But on average, are the targets equally distant to the center of the display in the two conditions? I mean, essentially, I mean, we, we only allowed target locations that were possible for both configurations. So we should essentially provide them no difference. Any square? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so that square on the right. Yeah, rather than say mm -hmm. they burn that picture, they burn the obviously you need to look for something inside the square, so they look for the big square first to see what's inside it. Yeah, I mean I guess that would entail that you that you actually recognize the square. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if that's really the case. I mean that might be the case here and here, but not there. Mm -hmm. So in that experiment two, we got the target off the square. Yeah. So are you saying that you can get the contextual curing effect from the square and that the object's outside the square? No, this is just an example of this place. So okay. So I'm just wondering then if the um, you know the idea of context implies sort of containment <laughs> and there's no containment relation when you've got the random uh, yeah. arrangement. Um, I guess it might be like one explanation for that. Mm -hmm. So you like sort of segment the display into into if you want surfaces and only the kind of segmented surfaces reveal contextual learning, but if you want the, the other parts of the display that are not segmented, are uh, not looked after in a way, no, that there's no learning for these distinctions. So I mean, if you come back to the point that I originally made to you when you started the talk, right, if you have four elements and four, uh, what, is, what is it, a corner or a square, even if they're not giving you closure, but you represent those four points. If you can extract that from a, a complex display such as that, you've got an object on set. If you've got an object on set, and you know that there's an element within that object on set, you've essentially reduced your, your, your set size. Now, you, you would argue probably, well, hang on, that means that you'd have to be spotting that this is a square in the right. I think that that's perfectly reasonable. If I've worked out in, in the course of the experiments over a multitude of many, many, many trials, that there's a square somewhere in there. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's the next. Uh, I'm to take you back. Hmm? <laughs> that's the next slide, I guess. Oh my god. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Let's let you finish. Okay. Your effects were very good. saying Let me finish. <laughs> the effects might have something to do with attention, in a way. Like well, I don't really know. I don't yeah. even know what people mean. At least that's how I phrased it. So, uh, so it has been shown, at least since 91, 
<laughs> that was a long time ago, wasn't it? Excellent <laughs> paper. <laughs> Perceptual grouping not only affects contextual learning, but also the deployment of attention. And typically, group regions are prioritized. And there are a number of papers on that issue. I've cited a few. And so what we did is we ran an additional analysis on our three experiments. So now we only looked at new context displays because these are essentially the baseline displays and there is no effect of contextual learning here. So, so you can forget about learning in this display. We compared target on versus off condition to see whether there's a difference in processing these. So essentially we will compare these two. Um, and here's for experiment one the results. So if you compare that, then you get basically uh, a replication of the previous papers. You find that when the target is enclosed within the square boundaries, then you are faster to respond than if it's outside. So that there's a target on benefit. Um, so there's like some capture by the square helping you to process the information within the square. Um, if you look at that across all three experiments, then you can see that there's this benefit here. We can also see for the non-square, but not for the random square. So it seems this capture effect vanishes as you decrease the salience of the figure. But on the other hand, the cumulative effect stays as it is. So if you put it all together, it will look like this. Um, yeah. And so it seems that like quite rather subtle groupings can already help you to already modulate this contextual human effect. Um, yes. Yeah, so you have some framework by means of object segmentation within which the search context is acquired. You have this difference between learning within but not outside of groupings. But on the other hand, attention is directed primarily to salient groupings and not so much to these subtle organizations. So if you want to, well then, find a target efficiently in your bedroom, my suggestion would be to organize it like that. <laughs> um, okay. And so that's the summary overall. So I think to have shown you some evidence for global precedence in attention, tasks related to Kalitza figures. Also shown you some results where I try to make a relation to short-term memory with novel figures. Finally, I showed you some long-term learning effects and the effects of perceptual grouping thereupon, if you want. So, thanks for your, for your attention, thanks for many questions, and for the invitation to come here.